Uh, hey, Sharon. Firstly, uh, thank you for agreeing, you know, to do a podcast episode with me. Um, can we start with a little introduction about yourself and the work that you do? Absolutely, Rohit, and thank you so much for inviting me here. So I wear a number of hats. I am the co-founder of Mission Equality, which is a company focused on leading, helping leaders to develop in such a way that they create more equal workplaces and organizations. I am the founder of Sharon's Anti-Racism Newsletter, which brings my global perspectives on racism based on my experiences in the UK, the Caribbean, the US and elsewhere. And I am the author of an essay collection entitled I'm Tired of Racism and a book on colorism called Exploring Shadism. And my background is in journalism, education uh, and, and writing generally. Uh, that, that's, that's great to um, hear. I'm, I'm super excited to learn from your knowledge, you know, expertise and, you know, global perspective. So, yeah, diving right into the topic, right? So just, just curious on, you know, want to know or just want to learn more about, you know, what was the American, you know, history of racism after civil rights movement? Well, people often think of the civil rights movement as being the time when everything got better. But in fact, it was it was a point in time when some things got better in law, but people's experiences day to day did not necessarily get better. You know, if you talk to black Americans, African Americans, or just black people visiting the U.S., their experience can be very different from the experience of those in white skin in terms of how they are treated in housing, how they're treated in education, how they're treated in the justice system, how they're treated in the workplace. Just their day-to-day -day experience is still very discriminatory. You know, they're still black people, black Americans, African Americans still experience a, a lot of discrimination and differential treatment compared with their white counterparts. Yeah. So do you think it has changed in, in the, the past 20 years, at least? Well, define change, Rohit. <laughs> or the change, you know, I mean, the, the racism, you know, the level I of this. Yeah, 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 sure. Well, I don't know. There was a point at which it seemed like, you know, progress was being made in some areas. But more recently, it seems like that progress has been is being rolled back. And, you know, if you think about the murder of George Floyd in May 2020 and a lot of corporate and organizational commitments to do better, um, you know, there were two things that stood out. Well, there were several things that stood out. One thing that stood out is that, you know, a lot of white people were shocked by that. But black people, brown people were not shocked at all. This would represented their day to day experience. Right. And so we're only talking two years ago. And what has happened since is that despite all those comments, all those commitments, uh, a lot of organizations are rolling back their commitments to diversity, equity, inclusion, their anti-racism commitments. Uh, I think it has woken up some people, but it has also, I think a lot of people are still afraid of making the necessary change. So while I won't deny that there has been some progress in the last 50 years and maybe in the last 20 years, it's not nearly enough, and there's constant pushback against anything that looks like progress, anything that looks like benefiting people of the global majority, anything that looks like redressing the balance and righting the wrongs. There is pushback from a segment of society. So I question the extent of the progress that has been made. Fair. Yeah. So can you give a couple of examples in terms of what was the pushback or like in what segments there is really a pushback. Just want to learn more about that. Okay, so let's take very recently in the Florida governor just signed into law a bill which would stop the ability to have um, AP African American history on the grounds that it was not relevant, right? Um hmm. There have been, you know, there's, there's something I think that they keep flirting with 
you know, stopping um, critical race theory, right? And and anything that looks like telling the totality of the history, because this is the problem, right? That and it's not, it's not yeah. just the case in the U.S. It's the case in other places. It's in the places. It's the case in places where there's been a colonial past, which is quite a lot of <laughs> a lot of the world, which is that. A lot of the history that we learn comes from one lens only, and that's the lens of the people that colonized or enslaved our ancestors. And there, you know, there are movements among some to stop the totality of the history being told. And that totality includes that in many cases, the people that were enslaved or colonized had a long history before that, had their own version of progress, which looked very different from the European Americans or Europeans version of pro progress. It, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a long history. It was a history where um, that other people pulled from that, you know, these were countries with their own wealth, with their, their own, their own history, their own languages, their own cultures. And so in a lot of cases that isn't told. And then when you, come back to the African-American context, you know, often there's the idea that, you know, history started with the enslavement of black people, for, you know, black, for, history for black people started with, the, with their enslavement in, in America. And then, you know, we had the Civil War, the Civil Rights Movement, and now everything is great. And, you know, that's an extremely um, partial view of history True. and yep. I think we have to do better. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think we should definitely teach or educate ourselves or our know, kids in the totality of the history because without knowing the history or learning about the history, you know, the present is not very relevant, right? You have to understand exactly. it to make sure, you know, to understand or observe the present and, and, and take it forward, right? So yeah, thanks for sharing that. And and since you mentioned about critical race theory, can you provide us some insights about it? My understanding, and I, I'm not an expert in it, is that this was a concept co coined by um, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, along, along, among others, and, and she was the person who came up with the um, idea of intersectionality as well, the idea that, you know, we have multiple identities that intersect within us. And it's about taking a, taking a view, really, of, of and, and an understanding of how we get there. In a, in a sense, it's, a, it's asking us to embrace that totality and not just see uh, the, the, the fiction of race through one lens. Yeah, so in the sense that I think, so what, what does that totality mean in the sense um, it, it's about, it's you know, what, all, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, sure. Yeah, no, it's back to what we were talking about before. It's about taking a, um, a critical and informed lens and, and approach to seeing how questions around race play out within our societies, you know, and, you know, not necessarily just accepting things as they are and taking them for granted, but really seeing how did they come, how did they come to be this way? And, 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 you know, how do they operate? You know, what are the systemic issues that cause things to operate in the way that they do, right? It's not just about, you know, a lot of people think about racism as, you know, calling people names, right? And there's so much more to it than that. There's the whole system that underpins discrimination, right? And, you know, that's one of the things that you look at when you take a critical approach. True. True, because, you know, if, I think there has been pushback for this critical race theory in general. Uh, I've, I've you know, been reading about it a little bit. So it also directly or indirectly conveys that every, you know, white person is a racist consciously or unconsciously, uh, you know, and, and they can make choices 
you know, that may fuel to racism at least, even they may not realize. So w what's your thought process on it? I think that a lot of us in the world are socialized into the idea of white supremacy. And I think this applies to both to white people and to people of the global majority. You know, in my own case, you know, I grew up in the Caribbean, a place with a history of enslavement, a place where you had the plantocracy system, and that system is also founded on the idea that white people are at the top and black people are at the bottom. And, you know, okay, so, you know, enslavement ended, uh, countries became independent, but the people who inter inherited the wealth, for the most part, still have the wealth. And the people who didn't inherit the wealth are, in some cases, still struggling to, to create some for themselves and their families. Um, in addition to that, in terms of the question you actually asked about um, white people supporting the system of white supremacy and supporting racism without even knowing it, there's a certain taken for grantedness in the way things operate. You know, if you grow up in a society where you don't face obstacles because of the color of your skin, you might not even realize that other people are having a different experience. If you, you might take it for granted that you can walk into certain places, that you have a certain relationship with law enforcement or whatever it happens to be. And you might find yourself be, buying into media narratives that suggest that people who don't look like you uh, have something wrong with them or deserve the dif differential treatment that they're getting. And all of that helps to ups uphold the system. By not questioning the system, you help to uphold it. You know, and this is even before you get to the people who consciously uphold it, right? Yeah. I think as a white person, as a would-be ally, accomplice, advocate, or anti-racist, you know, part of that process is questioning the things that you have taken for granted all your life. And it may get very uncomfortable because let's face it, you know, one of the things that we talk about at, at Mission Equality is, is, you know, changing the language we use. Right. So sure. I don't accept, for example, that in certain places I'm a minority because, in fact, black and brown people are the global majority, as Rosemary Campbell Stevens said. I might be minoritized or, as we tend to say, deliberately disadvantaged, whereas white skin gives many people an unearned advantage. Right. Something they just inherit. They don't have to do anything special. They were born with that skin, they sure. get that advantage, they benefit from it. You know, and yeah. white people also benefit from the, 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 the racist systems, the systems of oppression that have led to them having this unearned advantage. All of that needs to be questioned. Sure. I mean, I, I see uh, where you're coming from and, and I, I agree with, uh, you know, all these things. But if you, you know, I just want to think, you know, as a, you know, in the shoes of a white person, right? Like, you know, if you think, take about, you know, average American, uh, white American, and, you know, if they're just, let's say they are, you know, living their life, you know, without doing any harm to any, or without doing any of these racist things, and they just want to care, take care of their family and just, just live their life, right, in a normal way. So why should those Americans really should care about, you know, critical race theory and, and anti-racism in general? Because, because sure, they, they have an they, they have an advantage, but it doesn't mean that, you know, uh, I mean, they have to now let, let, let it go or like they have to start contributing to it, right? Should they really care about it? I think, I think that everybody has to care, you know, partly for the sake of humanity, partly for us all to get out of roles that we did not choose. You know, we, some of us have inherited roles of the oppressed and some inherited roles of the oppressor, and that can't sit very comfortably. Uh, and, and just for the sake of, of, of equality, you know, I think when we know more about each other, when we know that things are fair and equal, then, you know, we can sleep more comfortably at night. You know, it can't feel good. It can't feel good to know that 
you have earned certain, you, you inherited certain benefits because of the color of your skin, while other people have inherited certain disadvantages. And that's yes, you want to take care of your family, but is it right or good to take care of your family at the expense of other people? I don't know. I think we need to concentrate on our shared humanity. And if we think about our shared humanity, then equality becomes the only reasonable goal. Sure. So, you know, that, that makes, you know, all, all sense uh, in logically, right? But if you think about it, why should, you know, uh, I think that I am, you know, benefiting from the being the oppressor, right? You know, that's, that's a long history and I don't actually have to care about it right now or you know in fact thinking about this racism and being an oppressor and thinking of the fact that hey i earned this income by oppressing other people or my grandparents earn this income so in fact if you consciously think and do something about it that makes them more uncomfortable than their regular day life right so if you start asking this <laughs> you know, critical questions. And if you talk about critical race theory, you know, that makes, that can make them very uncomfortable. You know, they're just happy the way they are. So why should, in, they're not, you know, worsening the system. So why should they really care about it is, is what I'm trying to say. I'm going to, I'm going to reverse that and say, that why should we allow people to stay comfortable with that, that history and that legacy? Why should we not encourage people to ask the hard questions and to really examine whether they deserve to have what they have or whether it needs to be shared out a bit more widely. You know, I, I, I really believe that it is something that it's a question, you know, the way that we have done things up until now, oppressing certain people, putting other people on a pedestal and, you know, it goes hand in hand with colonialism and capitalism and destroying our planet. You know, it's a, it's a particular mindset, right? And okay, so you're afraid of losing out because you might have to give something up. But, you know, get, is, it, you know is, is it worth it to give something up and regain some of your humanity is my question. I think even this concept of humanity may be subjective to them, right? For example, if you, if I, you know, think from <laughs> their standpoint, in a way, you know, uh, yeah, I, I mean, what, what is, I mean, I, I don't know what, how people think about it, but, you know, uh, maybe, you know, humanity can be very subjective, right? For example, for some people, it can be, so, you know, donating some meals in a certain days, you know, and they are incredibly happy with it without looking at the global mm -hmm. picture of what they earned or what they don't earn, you know, that they still think that they are doing great. Right. And, you know, watching for black persons or, you know, uh, un underrepresented or undeserved uh, communities, you know, watching for them. And some people think that, Hey, you know, we are an, an, an ally for them and see, we are doing great in, in general. So why should you, <laughs> you know, I think this, this concept of humanity in general is uh, very subjective. So, you know, you know, Rohit, there are going to be some people that are quite comfortable with the status quo and they're going to stay with it. And there are other yeah. people that are going to question how we got to where we are and whether there's a better way. For me, sure. I see my audience as that second group, the people who are questioning how we got to where we are and wondering if there's a better way. Right? And sure. those are the people that I tend to I tend to talk to. And then, you know, maybe you know, there's a ripple effect and they talk to some of those other people who might not want to learn directly from me, sure. but might w learn from their fellow, you know, people who are taking a different viewpoint and a different attitude. Um, I just don't think that yeah. we can keep going the way that we have been. And, sure. and, and things need to change. And part of that is, is righting some of those wrongs of the past and the way those wrongs still operate in the present. Because all of that history... Yep has very real impacts in the experiences that we're having today. I agree. So, uh, I, you know, I'm totally with you on in terms of we definitely need to change this. Um, and and it's some uh, majority of it has to be rewritten because it has been unfair to many, many groups, and to be honest, across the you know, world, right? And particularly in the U.S. So, because... Um, 
you know, the reason that I ask this is that, for example, you know, if you talk, even if you talk about anti-racism or critical race theory, you know, I think it certainly makes, you know, uh, we are certainly calling out that, hey, you know, you all are racist, you know, knowingly or unknowingly. So, and you have to change about it. You know, you have to change. You have to start talking. It's like, you know, and, and technically most of the, you know, American, white Americans may or may not, doesn't have to care about it because they are just living their normal lives. Right. And so I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is, you know, we are, we think that we may be asking the uh, difficult questions, but I think those questions can make them, you know, uncomfortable and, and take them towards more right uh, is, is what I'm thinking. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't totally agree. Mm -hmm. I, because, because the one, the one beacon of hope that I have seen is that there have been more white people waking up to how things are and really prepared to do the work. Right. And, you know, by work, I mean, act, be actively anti-racist, be actively pushing back against this conditioning and be actively talking to others and calling them in and getting and, you know, spreading this word about anti-racism. I sure. think that there's, uh, you know, the people that, that don't believe in this at all and are fighting against more equality. They already think the way they think. They feel the way that they feel. And, you know, we already know that there are, there are large groups of those not just in the U.S., but in different parts of the world, right? Yeah. It's very difficult to reach those people. But, you know, it is, you can reach the people that are, that are you know, thinking more, more critically about, about how we got here, about what needs sure. to happen, about their role. Because it's not just, you know, we often think about, these things or some, you know, it's often presented as if some of this stuff is in the past, but it is still the present. It is still the present. You know, I was reading an article yep. recently about um, some black people in the U.S. who didn't find out that enslavement had ended until the 1960s. OK, <laughs> so because because yep. I guess they were in a small area. And, you know, it was the, it was in, they were living in virtually the same conditions until then. So, you know, it's not something that was long ago. And so there are people who are alive today who are benefiting from that system. And there are people sure. who, I know one of the pushbacks that people have is, okay, well, I'm not particularly well off. I'm not doing that well. How is it that I have privilege? And I, I say to sure. those people, the privilege of, not risking death if the police stop you is something that you get by having that white skin. The privilege of not being stopped as a potential criminal or followed around when you're in a shop. You know, the privilege of being able to find housing where you can afford. The privilege of benefit, be benefiting from certain things that it's harder for black and brown people to, to benefit from. The privilege of largely being be believed when you report you're in pain when you go to see a doctor, which is something that doesn't often happen with black people, right? I mean, you know, all of these things which have nothing to do with actual money are privileges that you enjoy sure. by walking in that white skin. And so sure. if you recognize that injustice, how can you not want to do something about it? Sure, yeah. You know, make makes sense, uh, right? Um, and and those are, you know, in that's a basic necessity <laughs> that everyone should expect. But uh, it's very sad that it hasn't been so so common. And and I totally agree that we need to talk more about it, or we need to find more ways to you know resolve or work towards equality. But here I'm going to you know quote John McWhorter, right? Who is the author and the linguist and uh, He's the author of uh, the woke racism, I guess. So mm -hmm. he says that, you know, the concept of anti-racism is being taken extreme, thus leading to the woke racism, which in turn will only harm black community. 
right? And and I can see why he's coming from that that perspective, and and want to get your thoughts on it. I disagree, but that is not going to be a big surprise. I think that if we talk about it and we encourage people to action, that in the long run, we will all benefit. Uh, I don't see how anything is resolved by not bringing it into the light. Okay, I don't see how not sure. talking about it and not encouraging people to do better is going to help resolve the issues. If you're not talking about them, how are you doing anything to solve them? So I think we have sure. to talk about them and we have to talk about them loudly. And we also have to share the experiences that we're having that a lot of white people are not um, aware of. I have uh, currently nearly 4,000 subscribers to my anti-racism newsletter. A good number of those are white people wanting to learn more and just hear a little bit about what it's like to walk in this skin in different places, in different countries, in different situations. And, you know, for a lot of them, these are not things that they have access to. You know, these are not things that they know about, you know. And so once they know about these things, then they start to look at the world differently and they start to want to do something about them. But if we're not talking about them, if we're not telling those stories, if we're not sharing those experiences, how are we ever going to solve anything? So, yeah, I, I don't agree. I don't agree at all. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. I think, you know, I think one perspective to that is that, sure, you know, for example, if you, if you take the privilege example that we are talking um, right before this question, right? So... Instead of saying that, hey, you have all the privileges, you know, you can go to the doctor, you cannot be stopped by police or something, mm -hmm. you know, should we approach the saying that, hey, you know, we don't still have access to medical care or we are still being harassed by police. Instead of calling the out there privileges or the privileges of the majority or, or white American, is there any harmonial way to say that, hey, you know, we are in 2023 and we still don't have access to these things and it's very brutal? Can I, can't we go from that standpoint instead of, you know, calling out critical race theory or, or you know, or, you know, uh, and, and anti-racism and all? Sometimes you've got to call a thing a thing, Rohit. Sometimes you've just Agreed. got to call a thing what it is. And, you know, my, but, my approach but, in the newsletter is to tell the stories and let people understand those experiences. I, I actually take a perspective of sharing sharing experiences and then inviting people to do better and to learn from those experiences. Sure. And so there's not a lot of calling out. There's a lot of pointing out. If you see what I mean, I state what is happening. Sure. I say mm -hmm. how I feel about it. And then after that, mm -hmm. it's up to the readers to say, okay, well, I learned something. I'm going to do something about it. Right. Sure. I, I, but I, again, I, I, I go back to, you know, you can't, you're not going to solve racism by A, failing to talk about it, and B, prioritizing white comfort. Prioritizing white comfort is why we're still where we are. You know, it's, it's way past time now. You know, you have to start calling things out, saying what they are, urging people to action and saying, well, no, this is not good enough. Yeah. We have to do better as a, as, as, a, as a people. We have to do better and we all have to work on it. Yeah, it makes sense. I think, I mean, we definitely need to have these uh, discussions and, and we definitely need to call out in, in certain, you know, regards or in, in most, maybe all the other regards. Um, but, you know, the other question that I have for you is, for example, if you're thinking purely from anti-racism standpoint, uh, don't you think we see everything with, with the racist lens? In the sense, uh, because you know, le, le, oh you know, I just gosh. I just have an analogy here, right? Uh, <laughs> so I have an analogy here. Uh, you know, to be honest, this is one of the questions that I asked. Uh, you know, I went to a HBCU for my masters. This is one of the question mm -hmm. that I asked one of my um, you know co colleagues back then as well. Um, so, let's say you know I want to buy a car, and if I go on the road, all I see is that certain car for the most part. Right. I and mean, there are many other things going on too, but I just see that, you know, car. So similarly, you know, if you are, you know, I might be giving just a horrible example, but you, you probably understand the point, right? So if you are 
just thinking about this concept of antithism, what we see or what we call out is mostly that. So is, is, do you think that's the right approach? I, <laughs> it's funny you should ask that question because my response would be that if we see racism everywhere, it's because it is pretty much everywhere, especially if you are a global majority um, person existing in a white majority space, because it is embedded in our systems and institutions and organizations and how they operate. So for the most part, there's no part of your life that is not touched by racism, white supremacy, and, and oppression. Now, is it possible to have good days in there? Of course it is. Is it possible to have days when it's less of a factor in your life? Of course it is. But it is always there in the background because that is how the countries were founded. You know, the U.S. was founded on genocide and enslavement. The U.K. and many European powers made their money through genocide and enslavement. You can't deny that history. And the institutions sure. that are still rich and well thought of and respected by many and some of the key figures that you think of in, in, in society are people who directly benefited or organizations that directly benefited from a system that oppressed other people. So, so yeah, you have, you know, you, <laughs> you have to... You have to talk about it. You can't prioritize sure. white comfort. You can't just say, okay, I'm going to try and do this in a way that's going to make you feel good about it. I mean, what's to feel good about it? How can you feel good about genocide and oppression and its enslavement? To expect to be coddled, to expect to, be, to have your feelings um, looked after when having that discussion is, is unrealistic, Right. For us cool. to have yeah. spent centuries trying to do it within that system, well, no, okay, that's not worked because we still have all these other things that are these things that are happening, and so yes, there are lots of ways in. You know, some people are militant and they're out and they're protesting, and some people are telling their stories, and people are on podcasts, and people are doing all the things. Then I think we need all the people working in their different ways to get to a point where one day we get beyond this. You know, this is not something I think is actually going to happen in my lifetime, but I, I still feel the urge to do my part. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, I know. I agree with, with you. Um, because, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, I'm not sure, because if, if the foundation is not right, I'm not sure how the, <laughs> how the upper layers can be fixed. Um, without mm -hmm. disrupting the foundation. So, but I'm not sure whether that's a possibility uh, given the nature of our society. Well, right. It's, mm -hmm. it's funny you should mention that. One of the things that we recently re um, released at uh, Mission Equality was our Equality Black Paper, which is uh, a 25 page document that looks at some of the ways we got here, some of the inequality what we imagine is a possible future that's more equal and some of the ways that we could approach that. And, you know, part of that approach is changing the way that we lead people. Chain, you know, thinking about moving away from a, a, a default of power and control to one of more trust and freedom. And it's something that we're modeling within our own company where mm -hmm. we have no C-suite titles, um, everybody leads. I'm a co-founder. There's uh, another co-founder, Leah Jovi Ford, and then other people within the company. We're quite a small team at the moment because we're pretty new. And the other people ha lead their particular areas. So you have somebody looking at neurodivergence, somebody looking at sustainability, somebody leading in education, etc. Right. And everybody is presumed to be competent in their area. And, and we have a very collaborative approach as well. You know, and there, there are a lot of other things that we're, you know, that we're putting in place in order to, to model what a more equal workplace could look like. And then on top of that, mm -hmm. we have um, what we're calling our MX Inequality, which is a, a leadership development program to show people how to, to look at where they are and to do better in their workplaces. And that's one piece of the puzzle. And, you know, we are not by any means saying that we have all of the answers. 
But what we are saying is that it's important to try to do something to change. And this is yeah. this is what we're doing. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. So I think, you know, I'm glad that you're you are calling out and you're providing more equitable approach. You know, that might seem very radical to, you know, many organizations or companies because, you know, it's just not <laughs> what we do. And, and it the most difficult change that we can actually get is, you know, the, to change the perspectives or thoughts of people, right? So it's it's not easy. Uh, but but I'm super grateful uh, that you're doing you know, a lot of lot of work that is very impo- important to the humanity and, and many people in US. Uh, thanks for that, Sharon. So and and coming, you know, I also want to get your thoughts on one more thing, Sharon. So again, quoting back John McWater, right? So say that if we take this anti-racism concept to the, on the little extreme side. It, in fact, instead of giving us the results, it may push the people who are in the center, you know, may, mostly the white, you know, American, may be towards right, you know, which might get Trump re-elected. So what he's saying is, you know, that's bad for the black community itself. So should maybe might have to take a different approach. I'm not sure whether he proposed a solution, but he's essentially calling out that this is not the right way of doing things. And then he's a black too. So I, what, what's your take on it? Well, first of all, black people are not a monolith. So, you know, people have their different views on how things should be approached. Sure. Uh, clearly, Nobody wants a return to Trump. That's not good for anybody, <laughs> right? That's not sure. that's not just bad for America. That's bad for the whole planet. Okay, nobody wants that. Um, yeah. But but I I disagree that talking about it. You know, if you think if you think that it is okay to oppress and discriminate against black and brown people. My telling you that I, I see that is not going to change your mind. If you are not committed to anti-racism, then you're not committed to anti-racism. My telling you that anti-racism is a priority for me is not going to change your mind or your commitment. If you are committed to it already and you see the need for it, my talking about my experiences might give you more reason to be committed I don't know that if your if your anti-racism stance can be swayed towards the far right by something that I say, then I have to question how committed you were to anti-racism in the first place. Right? And yeah. so I think if you really are committed, talking about it isn't going to make you less committed. If you're on the fence, well, maybe you need to do a little more reading and learning and self-education to see why continuing to fight racism is the right approach. Sure. But but do you think people uh, are really investing or want to invest in, you know, educating themselves who are on the fence? I think, circling back around to something I... I mentioned earlier, I think that the people who are on the fence can be swayed by some of their peers. So I can talk to the people that already realize that there's a need for this, that there's a need to learn more, there's a need to educate themselves, there's a need to do better. But then they can go out and talk to those people who might be on the fence and maybe bring them to understand why they are, why they have taken the approach that they've taken, you know? I agree. I think, you know, one small conversation or one, one article at a time, you know, can take us a long way um, and, and can play a big role in the equitable society for sure. So I just, uh, you know, I have one more question, you know, uh, to ask. So sure. when I was reading about critical race theory and anti-racism, I've seen this in multiple places that these things are actually discrimin- dis- discriminatory against whites. So, which in fact is also a racism. So, w- what's your take on it? No, 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 no. <laughs> I, um, no, 
that is just that 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 is just ridiculous because again it comes it comes from a lack of understanding of what racism is you need to think about the systems and the power relations right all the you know the system that we have is one that favors white people in many countries in the US in the UK in in many countries and i would argue that in post colonial countries there's still some of that in the in the um society as well but that's a whole other issue and so yeah. i can i can you know i could say oh i don't like you as a white person i don't have the power to do anything about about, about it right i am not like you know when you are a white person and you call the police for something a black or brown person has done that black or brown person is probably going to end up in custody if i as a black person call the police for somebody something that a white person has done i might still end up in custody okay that is the difference <laughs> right that is, and, and, and i mean i'm not even making this up i mean we know that this has happened we know that this has happened people will you know a black person will call the police to help them with something and they'll end up in jail or dead right Yeah. and so uh it is not possible for me as a member of the deliberately disadvantaged group to be racist towards white people it doesn't i don't have the power most of us don't have the power we just don't have it okay we sure. can we can be biased yeah. right sure. we can we you know we might even discriminate but we can't enforce the system of racism we can't we can't systematically oppress white people we do not have that power so no i refute that entirely <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah uh, so I, <laughs> yeah it, it's funny you call that out but but you know that that's the reality of the society but you know even this may not be racist but even this biases and being discriminatory can in term be harmful for the black community itself right because you then start rebelling and then you know people might take hard stands you know which might not eventually result in a good result that the black community is expecting if you want your freedom sometimes you have to fight for it it's as simple as that you know if you want not to be oppressed sure. sometimes you have to you know sometimes you have to say the hard things sometimes you have to sure. force people to think differently we're not getting anywhere mm-hmm. by being quiet and failing to speak and waiting for people to recognize our humanity so we have to you yeah. know we have to take it to the streets and take it to the take it to the digital platforms and we have to we have to be vocal we have to be loud sure. we have to be consistent that's what i think yeah no, i agree i agree with you because so far we may have been vocal we may not have been loud enough in terms of upper, you know calling this out or in st- in terms of voicing the opinions uh, but i think that should be done and that should you know that will definitely go a long way i think yeah i mean we definitely have to you know continue the fight and and uh, keep fighting for our rights so i uh, you know i agree with you on it so thanks for you know sharing all this sharon i know you know these are not you know may it may look that i am approaching you know different way you know i'm just trying to eliminate some of the biases that in general people have and you know eliminate my own biases as well so you know just just curious to understand your thoughts on what immigrants should learn about the black history and and racism in us well first of all you have to go way beyond what is taught typically taught in schools you have to look out for black scholars and black thinkers and people who are teaching that history from a different perspective right um the 1619 project book by nicole hanna jones is one great place to start and then start reading start reading perspectives from other people right you can't just you can't just you know i've talked to a lot of black americans and you know what they say universally is that a lot of the history that is taught in schools of the black experience is is partial to say the least you know 
it leaves quite a lot yep. of the story out. And so you need to educate yep. yourself. There are, you know, not just about the history, because, the, you know, there's a temptation sometimes to think this is all in the past. And as I, I said earlier, it's very much in the present. Look about what's going on now. Look about what has happened recently. Look at the Ava DuVernay documentaries. Look, you know, there, there are so many resources out there where black people are telling stories of their history, our history and culture and, of, and experiences. So start looking for those and educate yourself. And, you know, if you have the opportunity to, you know, be in spaces where there are black people and to understand where they're coming from, then take that opportunity with a little bit of humility and the knowledge that you're not necessarily going to understand it all. Then go there with an open mind to learn. That's what I would say. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, thanks for sharing that. I think these, there is a lot of education that needs to be done um, because what we learned in the past is very curated in, so, in many ways. Um, and mm -hmm. that is only leading us to think from one standpoint. I think being conscious about it and finding a way to educate ourselves is very important. Uh, okay. So, and, and the other curious question is, you know, as immigrants, you know, we may not fully understand what black people go through day in and day out. Sure, we understand racism to a certain extent because, you know, Asians have seen, you know, racist attacks too. And, but it's not as nearly as close to, you know, what black, black people go through every day. So can you educate us a little more on the experiences of black people on day-to-day -day lives when it comes to racism? Well, racism basically pervades almost every aspect of your life. Although, you know, I don't want to say that this is the totality of the black experience because, you know, there are also pockets, you know, there are places where in America where you might be in a black majority town and you might have all black teachers and there might be black people all around you and you're kind of insulated from the rest of, you know, the, the, the experience. You're still going to have sure. the same lack of representation in the media and, you know, you may still have the same issues with your medical care and so on. But what, what you know, but then a lot of people also have these experiences where from, you know, the start of their day to the end of their day, they they are experiencing it, you know. And, you know, I, I can think about my own experiences um, in England where, you know, you know, you get up in the morning and the minute you actually leave your house, you know that people are seeing you as a black person first and a person second, right? And so, you know, you mm -hmm. might be sitting on a bus and there might be, you might have the only empty seat next to you and nobody will sit next to you. Or you might be waiting in a queue and people, white people in front of you would huddle together and move their bags as if you're trying to steal them. Or you're in a shop and you're getting followed around as if you're planning to steal things. Or you're in the office and you walk into a meeting room ready to give a presentation and somebody asks you to make the tea because they assume that that is why you are there. Or you get stopped by the security guard on the way in, even though you've already been working there for three months, but they stop you every day. You know, it's you're the person that gets your cases searched at the airport, right? You're the person that tries to flag down a cab and they won't stop for you, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and that is even with that is even without the the things about lack of medical care, um, lack of um, what's the other thing? You know, not being able to get houses in the places that you want, maybe not getting the loans at the right at preferential rates, finding it more difficult to get mortgages, all of those things, the whole system, right? Yep. And you know, people could be affected by all of those things in one day, and it could happen every day, okay. right? Yeah. So it's a lot. It, yeah, it's, and I think it is something for certainly for for immigrants to the country and to, for white people to be aware of that, you know, your black friends and colleagues might be having this experience every day for all their lives. You know, you meet somebody yeah. in their 30s or 40s, they've already had 
three to three and a half decades of experience with racism. There was a post on LinkedIn recently where, which asked, you know, what age were you when you first became aware of your race? And almost all the black people, it was somewhere between the ages of five and ten. Okay, so it starts early. Yeah. It starts early. By the time you get into yeah. the workforce after you've finished your, 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 your post-grad education, you could already have had 20, you know, two decades of experiences of racism that you're aware of. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's definitely a lot. I think it's, as immigrants, we have to, you know, really consciously understand it and, and find a way to be, you know, an ally or in the sense find a way to start questioning or, you know, supporting uh, many black and underrepresented groups. So, and, and how do you think this, uh, you know, allyship can be done right? Um, because sometimes it's not think, an easy conversation to have. So, I think there are, there are several aspects. You know, one aspect is believing people, believing black people, believing Asian people, you know, believing people when they tell you they have had a discriminatory experience, not gaslighting them about it, not finding other, other possible explanations, not minimizing it, not assuming it wasn't harmful because it didn't seem harmful to you, right? That's one aspect. But then the other aspect is how do you, how can you interrupt racism or how can you avoid being a perpetrator of racism yourself? You know, how can you, you know, you see your black colleague say something and then the white colleague is ignored and then the white colleague says the same thing and gets praised for it. And you, know, so you as a white ally can say, oh, yes, I'm glad you picked up on that point so and so made you know, did and uh, go back to that person and ask if they have anything to add. You know, sometimes that's what you can do. Sometimes it's about, you know, standing up when you see something that is racist or discriminatory happening in the moment. Because honestly, coming to me afterwards and saying, I'm sorry that happened to you, has very little impact compared with interrupting the person who was doing it in the moment. And part of that, you know, that's why we have you know, the education so that people can learn how to do that and to get comfortable with it. And one of the things that I've seen in the work we've been doing at Mission Equality and some of the allies groups that we have run is that if you are consistently talking about racism and learning about it and seeing the ways in which it shows up and learning strategies for interrupting it and for noticing it and for, you know, just raising your awareness and, 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 and level of action, you get to the point where you feel more comfortable identifying it, interrupting it, and countering it. And I've just seen this happen with many people in the groups that we've run. Yeah, I think uh, definitely those, thanks for sharing those. Um, I think I can um, see the importance of those. And, and the one point that I really want to call out is finding a way to interrupt it, right? It's not that expressing support after it has happened because essentially that mm. doesn't solve the root cause. So I think finding a way to interrupt and finding a way to be vocally and actively supporting um, the black and underrepresented groups is very, very important. So, Agreed. yeah. So th thanks for sharing all these, Sharon. So, you know, two last questions um, for you. So I think, I think this, this might be a little interesting. Let's see how this goes, but how do you think racism can be solved in U.S., right? And if given superpowers to you to take some measures that every American can follow, what would you do to solve racism? How could racism be solved? That's a big question. And yeah. in a sense, I think what it, what it requires is figuring out what it is we're really fighting for. Which is, which is equality. And sometimes that means taking equity steps on the road to redress historical and current imbalances. Uh, and basically it looks like interrogating every system that we now take for granted, you know, education, justice, how workplaces function, etc., etc., and looking at, you know, 
you know, where's the representation of black people? Are our voices being heard and taken account of? Are people being held accountable for their racism? Um, is the environment equitable, etc.? cetera? Are, are our leaders in a position to, to, to lead us to more, more equality in the spaces that we inhabit in the communities that we're in? Ah, so if I had superpowers, what would I do? I, you know, I, I envisage a world where everybody has enough, you know. Everybody would be housed, would have enough to meet their needs, to get their food. Everybody would have access to great um, education and learning if that's what they wanted to do. People would have work that was, was fulfilling, you know, people would be able to be their best selves, which I know sounds a little woo-woo, but, you know, um, and I, you know, and I think that it is actually, even though it seems far away, if we took a different stance on what mattered, if we realized that we had to redress those imbalances, it is something that we can achieve, and it would be great for our planet as well. If we moved away from an extractive mindset, which is not just about taking things out of the planet, but how we treat the, the idea of people's labor. If we moved away from yeah. that to something that was more community-minded and more holistic mm. and more sustainable, then, you know, I'd wave my ma magic wand and make that happen. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it makes sense, I think. And, and do you think that, you know, if, let's say, wealth is distributed equally uh, in the sense that if everyone has access to housing, Medicare, education, um, then the racism can be solved in a way or will be more equitable. Uh, I think that's true, but will not solve racism. I think that's, you know, that's, that's one step. Removing the, the inequality is one step changing people's minds and getting them to see us all as human beings who are inherently worthy and valuable is another step. And, you know, some people already see that and some do not. So, you know, over time, it would be a case of reaching those who do not. Yeah. True. Yeah. Makes sense. Thank, thanks for sharing this. This is, uh, I'm with you on it. So, yeah, thanks. Uh, so one, yeah, one last question. Uh, I think this is this is one question that I ask every guest on my podcast. Is can you help us learn something in two minutes that took a very long time for you to learn? <laughs> uh, okay. Whatever comes to mind, you know, it can be just uh, yeah. What, anything, uh, whatever what comes to mind. Okay, one of my favorite sayings is by um, a musician called Guante. And it says, racism isn't the shark, it's the water. And that means mm -hmm. that we're all, we, you know, we tend to look at it as this thing or that thing, but in fact, it's what we're all swimming in and surrounded by. So that's my lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Wow. Well, yeah, <laughs> that that's deep. So uh, I don't know how we can address the water. You know, shark. Sure, we can do so many things. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know how we can change or transform the water. Uh, but but yeah, makes sense. That is the goal. Cool. Uh, that's what we have to do. Yeah, it's it's a long way to go. But but yeah, I think it all starts with one step and one conversation. And and thanks for all the work that you do with uh, your you know mission mission equity and anti racism newsletter. I've read you know many of the articles and th they gave me a lot of insight and they add a lot of value to my knowledge. So thanks for doing uh, everything, Sharon, and thanks for your time today. It, it has been a great experience, and this is kind of the conversation that I've been wanting to have for a long time, uh, so that you know we can eliminate you know many biases, which is my goal with this podcast. Thanks so much, Rohit. It's been a pleasure. And Thank you. I've really enjoyed our conversation. I, I, I it's, it's um, good, so good to, uh, you know, hear that. So thank you.